It is a great pleasure now to welcome our keynote speaker for tonight, that is Professor Bruce Hoffmann of Georgetown University. Um, Bruce is not just a professor in uh, the School of Foreign Services at Georgetown, he also directs, until a few days ago, the Center for Security Studies at uh, Georgetown. Um, he also is a visiting professor at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where he helped to establish the Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence. And before going to Georgetown, Professor Hoffman uh, worked for the RAND Cooperation. He was actually the director of the RAND office in Washington, D.C. Uh, Professor Hoffman has also been asked to help the United States government in their efforts to defeat terrorism. He was the lead author of the final report published by the Independent Commission to review the FBI's response to the 9-11 uh, response for terrorism and radicalization. He was a scholar in residence at the CIA between 2004 and 2006, and it's of course always good to have good relations with the CIA, so I'm glad you're here. <laughs> But I may uh, add, we are not passing the details you gave us on the mailing list. So we are not <laughs> passing it on to anyone, certainly not to the CIA. Um, Professor Hoffman also was an advisor to the Iraq study group, and at present he advises the US National Intelligence University on drawing up a new curriculum and organizing their efforts to teach uh, counterinsurgency and how to defeat international terrorism, which of course is a very demanding task. I think uh, Bruce Hoffman has been extremely busy and already in 1994 the director of Central Intelligence recognizes and awarded him a prestigious medal that was the US Intelligence Community Seal Medallion and um, that was given to uh, Professor Hoffman for really contributing to safeguarding the security and safety of the United States. And in addition to all these many efforts, advising efforts, teaching efforts, research efforts. Um, Bruce Hoffman has also written many, many books. And I hear in the conversation at the reception before, uh, before the, uh, 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 this event, uh, I hear that many of you have actually read chapters of your book uh, in the, on the TAM program and in many other undergraduate programs. Particularly known is uh, Bruce Hoffman's acclaimed book, Inside Terrorism, that has been in print for the last two decades and has also been published in many foreign languages. I don't wish to list all of Bruce Hoffman's publications, that would take me an hour or so, so let me just mention his book Evolution of the Global Terrorist Threat from 9-11 to Bin Laden, to Bin Laden's death, which came out in 2014, and uh, already in the year after, he published Anonymous Soldiers, The Struggle for Israel, 19. 17 to 1947 that came out with Knopf in 2015. Needless to say, he also got many book prizes and other distinguished um, uh, prizes and citations. And I, again, I apologize, I don't want to list all of them. It is of, of course a great pleasure and an honor to have Bruce Hoffman here with us today. He will open our camp conference on international terrorism and he will talk, uh, give a keynote address and talk about the transatlantic alliance and terrorism, uh, aligning responses and cooperation to threats and challenges. And afterwards, there's uh, the opportunity for you to ask many difficult questions. And Bruce Hoffman has said that he will do his best to answer all of them. So I expect, in particular, the, the many students in the audience not to be shy, but to ask plenty of questions afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me. Uh, please help, join me in welcoming Bruce Hoffman to UNC Chapel. Thank you, class, for the extremely kind introduction. Uh, let me thank the Center for European Studies and also the Department of History Thanks for inviting me as well. I'm always impressed having been trained as a diplomatic and military historian, but spent most of my career navigating between history and international relations and uh, political science when the history departments have as much of a contemporary as an historical view of events, and especially when they still have a specialization in military history, which is unfortunately a, a dying vocation around the world. So I'm especially pleased to be here um, this evening. Uh, I'm going to do things the old-fashioned way, and I actually wrote a paper. I'm going to read that, read that paper because I think uh, sometimes the complexity of ideas is lost in more off-the-cuff presentations. Uh, I've spent 
most of my career sitting watching PowerPoint, and although it has its place in, in, the, in, the, in the right circumstances, I think something as august as a keynote to this, uh, this very important conference uh, deserved a proper paper and then its uh, recitation. So, let me begin. Light up the fire on the flowing crowd, pour grenades on the crusader's head, don't have mercy until he's broken. This was the encrypted message that a Moroccan-born ISIS operative in Italy received from his commanders in the Middle East via WhatsApp last year. Although, Italian, although the Italian authorities were able to forward the series of attacks planned for that country, their French, Belgian, Turkish, German, Swedish, British, and American counterparts have been tragically less successful in preventing the succession of bloody ISIS-inspired or directed incidents that have convulsed Europe and the United States since 2015. Indeed, according to one compilation, ISIS to date has carried out at least 150 attacks in over two dozen countries that, excluding the carnage in Syria and Iraq, have claimed the lives of over 2,000 persons. There was a time not so long ago when the conventional wisdom was that ISIS's violence would somehow remain confined to the perennially volatile and bloody Levant in Iraq. That wishful thinking was swept aside on November 13, 2015 by the biggest terrorist attack on a western city in over a decade. With no advance warning and in defiance of the prevailing analytical assumption that ISIS wasn't even interested in mounting external operations, and indeed lacked the capability to do so. Six simultaneous attacks killed 130 persons and wounded nearly 400 others. Just two weeks earlier, the group were similarly able to perpetrate the single most significant attack against commercial aviation in over a decade. A bomb placed on a Russian charter flight exploded shortly after departing from Sharm el-Sheikh, killing all 224 persons on board. The fact that ISIS again posed a salient threat to Europe's security for a second summer in a row, and once more has resurfaced in this country, should make us very circumspect about any conception we may have of fully understanding ISIS's capabilities and intentions, much less the threat it will continue to pose following the defeats in Mosul and Raqqa and the physical destruction of its caliphate. Because of ISIS's emergence and Al-Qaeda's stubborn resilience, today we arguably face the most parlous security environment since the period immediately following the September 11, 2001 attacks with serious threats emanating from not one, but two terrorist movements, who both have cultivated a myriad of branches and affiliates, thus enhancing their capabilities and ensuring their longevity. ISIS, alas, is here to stay, at least for the foreseeable future. Some two years before the 2015 Paris attacks, ISIS had built an external operations network in Europe that mostly escaped notice. Known as the Amin al karji or simply as Enmi or Omni, the respective Turkish and Arabic rendering of the word Omniat, or security service, this unit appears to function independently of the group's waning military and territorial fortunes. For instance, US intelligence and defense officials, quoted by Rukmini Kalamaki in her revealing August 2016 New York Times article, believe that ISIS has already sent hundreds of operatives into the European Union, with hundreds more having been dispatched to Turkey as well. If accurate, this investment of operational personnel ensures that ISIS will retain an international terrorist strike capability on some level, irrespective of its battlefield reverses in Syria and Iraq. ISIS's leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, had already instructed potential foreign fighters who were unable to travel to the caliphate to instead emigrate to other vilayets where ISIS's branches are located. This suggests that these other branches will likely develop their own external operations capabilities 
independent of the parent organization and themselves pre present significant future threats. Much as Al-Qaeda's franchises have over the past decade in Yemen, North Africa, and South Asia, among other places. The alleged involvement of ISIS's Libyan branch in last May's horrific bombing of a Manchester concert venue points to the realization of al-Baghdadi's diktat. According to the National Counterterrorism Center, ISIS has established at least 18 such branches throughout the world, most recently in the Philippines, Afghanistan, and Indonesia. Moreover, in addition to the presumed sleeper cells that ISIS has seeded throughout Europe, there is the further problem of at least some of the estimated 7,000 European foreign fighters returning home. They are only a fraction of the nearly 40,000 persons from more than 100 countries throughout the world who have trained in Syria and Iraq. What this means is that in little more than four years, ISIS's international cadre surpassed even the most liberal estimates of the number of foreign fighters that the U.S. intelligence community believes journey to Afghanistan during the 1980s and 1990s in order to join Al-Qaeda. In other words, far more foreign nationals have been trained by ISIS in Syria and Iraq during the past couple of years than more by Al-Qaeda in the dozen or so years heading up or leading up to the September 11, 2001 attacks. This recreates the same constellation of organizational capabilities and trained operatives that made Al-Qaeda so dangerous 16 years ago. And unlike the comparatively narrow geographical demographics of prior Al-Qaeda recruits, ISIS's foreign fighters cadre includes hitherto unrepresented nationalities, such as hundreds of Latin Americans, along with citizens from Mali, Benin, Bangladesh, and the small Caribbean island state of Trinidad and Tobago, among other atypical jihadi recruiting grounds. Meanwhile, the danger from so-called lone wolf attacks also remains. The late ISIS commander, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani's famous September 2014 summons to battle has hitherto proven far more compelling than Al-Qaeda's long-standing efforts to similarly animate motivate and inspire individuals to engage in violence in support of its aims. Exactly 16 years ago, for example, Al-Qaeda's current leader and then number two, Ayman al-Zawahiri, issued a similar call in his treatise titled Knights Under the Prophet's Banner. Published in a London-based Arabic language newspaper, it explained that tracking down Americans and the Jews is not impossible. Killing them with a single bullet, a stab, or a device made up of a popular mix of explosives, or hitting them with an iron rod is not impossible. Burning down their property with Molotov cocktails is not difficult. With the available means, small groups could prove to be a frightening horror for the Americans and the Jews. But al-Zawahiri was using an anachronistic media platform that was in the process of being rendered irrelevant by more immediate and pervasive 21st century technology. And his print, me and his, and his print message in an obscure paper consequently was seen by few and ignored by most. By comparison, Al-Adnani's plea quickly snowballed and has continued to gather momentum since. If you are not able to find an IED or a bullet, he memorably intoned, then single out the disbelieving American, Frenchman, or any of their allies. Smash their head with a rock, or slaughter him with a knife, or run over him with your car, or throw him down from a high place, or choke, or poison him. Indeed, despite Al-Adnani's 2016 death, his words still resonate, given the cumulative power of the internet and social media reaching a far larger audience, both faster and more effectively, and thereby creating a self-sustaining echo chamber that al-Zawahiri could never have achieved, much less have imagined. Utilizing a variety of freely available social networking platforms, such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Flickr, among others, 
Terrorist and insurgent groups today have thus introduced an even more direct and personally intimate form of messaging. ISIS has positioned itself at the forefront of this new revolution in terrorist communications. Indeed, since 2014, it has produced and disseminated a succession of increasingly more heinous and grisly propaganda videos of brutal executions and similar depredations that have captured the attention of a new generation of terrorist recruits. These videos and their unrestrained exaltation of violence have attracted far more viewers than Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri's comparatively priggish presentations recanting complex theological treatises or imparting didactic, philosophical, and historical lectures. Where Al-Qaeda and its affiliates saw the internet as a place to disseminate, disseminate material anonymously or meet in dark spaces, Robert Hannigan, the director of the British Government Communications Headquarters, GCHQ, the equivalent of the United States National Security Agency, notes, ISIS, he argues, has embraced the web as a noisy channel in which to promote itself, intimidate people, and radicalize new recruits. ISIS has thus been remarkably effective in its use of these social media to speak to a global audience, thereby completely bypassing and thwarting the traditional media from misinterpreting or otherwise distorting its core message. A common ISIS propaganda mantra, accordingly, is don't hear about us, hear from us. These social media platforms facilitate both ubiquitous and real-time communication between like-minded radicals and would-be recruits and potential benefactors, the phenomenon known as narrow casting. Also called niche marketing or target marketing, Gabrielle Weinman, the renowned Israeli terrorist communications expert, explains, narrow casting aims media messages at specific segments of the public defined by characteristics such as values, preferences, demographics, attributes, or location. Ease, interactivity, networking, reach, frequency, usability, stability, immediacy, publicity, and permanence are among the benefits to terrorist groups like ISIS who have nimbly adopted these technol who have nimbly have adapted these technologies for their nefarious purposes. I don't think it is far-fetched to say, an unnamed American intelligence officer commented in a May 2016 article detailing ISIS's mastery of digital media and technology, that the internet is a major reason why ISIS is so successful and so worried. ISIS's foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq, for instance, individually amass thousands of followers on platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. They communicated with them, or they communicated with their audiences, often on a daily basis, and sometimes multiple times each day, providing first-hand, immediate accounts of heroic battles and more mundane daily activities, making jihad accessible and comprehensible on a uniquely intimate and personal basis. These fighters effectively invited, motivated, animated, and essentially summoned their digital media followers and friends and other online contacts to come to Syria and Iraq and partake of the holy war against the apostate regimes of Bashar al-Assad and Haider al-Abadi. Blatant sectarian messages, coupled with divinely ordained clarion calls to resist Persian domination, and decisively affect the outcome of the eternal struggle between Sunni and Shia and the latter's Alawite satraps provided additional compelling incentives. Indeed, a 2014 ISIS recruitment video circulated via social media featured heavily armed militants with distinctive British and Australian accents, trumpeting the virtues of jihad and the ineluctable religious imperative of joining the caravan of martyrs. Through these voices, the group has been able to tailor its messages to specific target audiences back in these fighters' own neighborhoods, schools, clubs, community centers, and places of worship. Whereas the older version of terrorist websites effectively were waiting for visitors to arrive, Vyman argues, 
A social networking approach allows terrorists to reach their target audience and virtually knock on their doors. ISIS's unbridled visual depictions of particularly gruesome executions and other wanton acts of violence continue to galvanize the attention of the select audience and beseech them to join ISIS's struggle. A new generation of celebrity fighters, accordingly, has been created to facilitate this process. Ultraviolence, as Jessica Stern and J.M. Berger turn this phenomenon, sold well with the target demographic for foreign fighters. Angry, maladjusted young men whose blood stirred at images of grisly beheadings and the crucifixion of so-called apostates. Other types of appeals, <coughs> utilizing more traditional messages intended for more mainline religious audiences, are also used by ISIS to target this entirely different demographic. Familiar historical and theological references are invoked for this audience's consideration, and specific solicitations are directed to the descendants of pious families of ancient respected lineage and stature. <coughs> ISIS propagandists also portray the organization as messengers and executors of apocalyptic prophecies, promising the imminence of an inevitable clash between the forces of good and evil in an epic decisive battle as part of a compelling narrative with which to target potential recruits. These themes both resonate with and have a very powerful effect on their intended audiences. According to Will McCants, ISIS's eschatological arguments have infused the group with newfound momentum, producing an inrush of foreign fighters to Syria, many of them seeking a role in the end time drama. For terrorists today, the advantages of these new social media are thus as profound as they are manifold. It is therefore also not surprising to find that all of Al-Qaeda's most important affiliates, Al-Shabaab, Ansar al-Sharia, the Abdullah Azam Brigades, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Jabhat al-Nusra, and the Afghan Taliban, all have their own Twitter accounts on which they regularly tweet. In fact, during its lethal assault on Nairobi, Kenya's Westgate Shopping Center in September 2013, Al-Qaeda's Somali branch, Al-Shabaab, provided live, ongoing commentary of the attack over Twitter. In this respect, it should be noted that while ISIS has dominated the headlines and preoccupied our attention for the past four years, Al-Qaeda has meanwhile been quietly rebuilding and marshalling its resources for the continuation of its now 20-year-long struggle. Indeed, its presence in Syria should be regarded as just as dangerous and even more pernicious than that of ISIS. The priority that Al-Qaeda attaches to Syria may be seen in the special messages conveyed in February and June 2012, respectively by al-Zawahiri and the late Abu Yahya al libi in support of the uprising against the Assad regime, where they called upon Muslims in Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon to do everything within their power to assist in the overthrow of the apostate Alawites. The fact that Jabhat al-Nusra, or Jabhat Fatah al-Sham, or Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, regardless of what it calls itself, is even more capable than ISIS, and a more dangerous long-term threat, seems completely immaterial to those across the region who not only actively support and assist it, but actively seek to partner with what they perversely regard <coughs> as a more moderate and reasonable rival to ISIS. These deliberate obfuscations, both to eschew the Al-Qaeda name and portray its most important franchise in a more benign light than ISIS, reflects a calculated strategic choice taken by al-Zawahiri at a pivotal moment of Al-Qaeda's history. In 2013, he instructed the movement's fighters to avoid mass casualty operations in order not to cause the death of Muslim civilians and innocent women and children. At a time when ISIS was stunning the West with one atrocity after another, all staged for maximum effect on social media, the move in retrospect appears to have been a brilliant strategic choice. 
The legacy of al-Zawahiri's edict is evident in a tweet by a Dutch fighter belonging to Jabhat al-Nusra, who eagerly reminded his followers that unlike ISIS, al-Qaeda focuses mostly on political and military targets instead of civilians. It thus, or al-Qaeda, is thus able to present itself paradoxically as quote-unquote moderate extremists, <coughs> an ostensibly more palatable rival to ISIS. Across the region, a combination of individual sympathizers and malignant government officials not only quietly support al-Qaeda, but have come to see the group as a partner. This development may be seen as fitting neatly into al-Zawahiri's broader strategy of letting ISIS take all the heat and absorb all the blows from the coalition arrayed against it, while al-Qaeda quietly rebuilds its military strength and basks in its paradoxical cachet as moderate extremists in contrast to the unconstrained ISIS. Anyone inclined to be taken in by this ruse would do well to heed the admonition of Theo Padnos, also known as Peter Theo Kurtz, the American journalist who spent two years in Syria as a hostage of Jabhat al-Nusra. Padnos relates how the Nusra front higher-ups were inviting Westerners to the jihad in Syria not so much because they needed more foot soldiers, they did it, Padnos explained, but because they want to teach the Westerners to take the struggle into every neighborhood and subway back home. Finally, the importance of Syria to Al-Qaeda's plans may be seen in the members of the group's senior commanders, <coughs> members of the group's senior command, who have operated there. Musa al-Fadli, a Bin Laden intimate who, until his death from a U.S. airstrike in 2015, had commanded the Khorasan Group, al-Qaeda's elite forward-based operational arm in Syria. Haider Kirkan, a Turkish national and long-standing senior al-Qaeda commander, had been sent back to his homeland, presumably by Bin Laden himself, in 2010. His orders were to build an infrastructure in the region to facilitate the movement of key personnel hiding in Pakistan's federally administered tribal areas in order to escape the escalation of drone strikes ordered by President Obama. Kirkon was killed last fall as a result of a U.S. bombing raid in Idlib, Syria. According to the Pentagon, at the time of his death, Kirkon was actively planning the attacks described by Padnos. And a few months ago, Al-Qaeda reportedly instructed its franchises across the world to increase the kidnapping of Westerners in order to obtain the release of Muslims imprisoned in the West. Finally, in late 2015, al-Zawahiri dispatched Saif al-Adil, Al-Qaeda's most experienced and battle-hardened commander, to Syria in order to oversee the group's interests there. With this senior command structure in place, Al-Qaeda is thus well positioned to exploit ISIS's weakening military position and territorial losses, and once again regain its own preeminent position at the vanguard of the Salafi jihadi movement. ISIS, in any event, could no longer compete with al-Qaeda in terms of influence, reach, manpower, and cohesion. In only two do domains is ISIS currently stronger than its rival. The name recognition and power of its brand coupled with ISIS's presumed ability to mount spectacular terrorist strikes, strikes in Europe. But make, make no mistake, Al-Qaeda today is just as ambitious and dangerous as ISIS. From Northwest Africa to Southeast Asia, it has knitted together a global movement of some two dozen local franchises. Al-Qaeda is entrenched in Libya, where groups such as Ansar al-Sharia and the Benghazi Defense Brigades as well as Shura councils in Benghazi, Darna, and Sirt, advance the parent movement's interests. Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb is meanwhile active in surrounding countries, targeting Western aid workers in Taurus. It is credited with over 250 attacks in 2016. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, along the movement's most threatening and consequential franchise, now controls the ports and highways along Yemen's coastline, ensuring itself a continuous source of revenue from smuggling 
that is used to co-op local communities through the provision of goods and services that the shattered central Yemeni government cannot provide. Not surprisingly, its ranks have quadrupled in recent years. Al-Shabaab in Somalia has similarly expanded and regained lost momentum as it has beaten back attempts by ISIS to challenge Al-Qaeda's position in East Africa. Together with its Taliban allies in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda has re-established a presence in nearly half of that country's territory. The movement has made new inroads in Bangladesh and recently added a new franchise dedicated to the liberation of Kashmir. In all, Al-Qaeda now has tens of thousands of fighters. With 20,000 under arms in Syria alone, another 4,000 in Yemen, and 7,000 in Somalia, according to a variety of authoritative sources. Looking to the immediate future, ISIS's continuing setbacks and serial weakening arguably create the conditions where some re reconciliation with Al-Qaeda might yet be effective. Efforts to reunite have been continuous from both sides, virtually from the time of ISIS's expulsion from the Al-Qaeda fold in 2014. Regardless of how this reunification might occur, any kind of reconciliation between ISIS and Al-Qaeda or reamalgamation would profoundly change the current conflict and result in a significantly escalated threat of foreign fighter terrorist operations in the West. And let me move to conclude. The US-led war on terrorism has now lasted longer than both world wars and it surpassed America's prolonged military intervention in Indochina during the 1960s and 1970s. And just like the National Liberation Front or Viet Cong guerrillas and People's Army of Vietnam main force units half a century ago, our Salafi jihadi enemies have today locked the West into another enervating war of attrition, the preferred strategy of terrorists and guerrillas from time immemorial. They seek to undermine national political will, corrode internal popular support, and demoralize us and our alliance partners through a prolonged, spasmodically intensifying, and increasingly diffuse campaign of terrorism and violence. Most dangerously, they pursue a deliberate strategy of provocation, seeking to push our liberal democracies to embrace, to embrace increasingly illiberal security solutions that compromise fundamental civil liberties, demonize immigrants, threaten our core values, and thus validate the terrorist self-fulfilling clash of civilizations narrative. In his last publicly released videotaped statement, Bin Laden revealed precisely this strategy on the eve of the 2004 US presidential elections. So we are continuing this policy in bleeding America to the point of bankruptcy, he declared. Allah willing, and nothing is too great for Allah, this is in addition to our having experience in using guerrilla warfare and the war of attrition to fight tyrannical superpowers as we, alongside the Mujahideen, bled Russia for 10 years until it went bankrupt and was forced to withdraw from Afghanistan in defeat. Decisively breaking this stasis and emerging from this war of attrition must therefore be among the transatlantic alliance's highest priorities. Simply killing a small number of leaders and terrorist groups whose ranks in any event are continually replenished will not end the threats posed by ISIS and Al-Qaeda <coughs> nor dislodge them from their bases of operation in the Levant in Iraq, North, West, and East Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and South and Southeast Asia. The slow and fractured process of training indigenous government security forces in those regions will not do so either. The inadequacy of these training activities and efforts to build partner capacity are evidenced by the mostly unimpeded escalation of terrorist activities in all those places. Whether in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Somalia, or Yemen, our efforts to build partner capacity have foundered. In each, Islamist terrorist numbers have grown faster than we have been able to train indigenous security forces effectively. 
terrorist control over territory and the creation of new sanctuaries and safe havens has expanded, while local government sovereignty has contracted and the terrorist operational effectiveness has appreciably outpaced that of their government opponents. Elements of Al-Qaeda and remnants of ISIS arguably are now superior in tactics, firepower, and discipline compared with some of the conventional military forces and regional coalitions arrayed against them. While there has been some recent progress in Mali, Nigeria, Syria, and Iraq, it is not clear whether the past problems that undermine the performance of indigenous militaries have been adequately addressed, much less reversed. Accordingly, a complete reevaluation and systemic overhaul of our training and resourcing of foreign partners is required if we were to prevent the further spread of ISIS and Al-Qaeda branches and counter their entrenchment across the multiple regions in which they have already embedded themselves. Today, in contrast to the unity and resolve of 16 years ago, the transatlantic alliance's prosecution of the war on terrorism appears fractionated and self-centered. The landmark invocation of the collective self-defense provisions included in Article 5 of the NATO Charter seems an artifact of a long ago time given both the many contemporary security concerns and profound divisions that currently beset the alliance. NATO could do much more to fight terrorists and prevent international terrorism from spreading. The former Secretary General, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, complained shortly after last May's bombing of the Manchester concert venue. Since NATO's command of the United Nations mandated International Security Assistance Force, or ISAF, for <coughs> Afghanistan, ended in December 2014, the Alliance's active engagement in counterterrorism has been piecemeal and anemic. There is an exceedingly modest training mission in Iraq, but nothing at all in either Libya or Syria, for instance, arguably the key fault lines in the struggle against terrorism. The intermittent dispatch of mobile training teams to Egypt, Jordan, Mauritania, Morocco, and Tunisia during 2016, and the aerial surveillance provided by member state AWACS in support of anti-ISIS coalition ground operations in the Levant and Iraq, encapsulates the extent of NATO's ongoing active counterterrorism operations. The creation last December of the post of Assistant Secretary General for Intelligence and Security at NATO headquarters was a welcome and very important, if woefully belated, step forward. But with a staff of fewer than 50 persons and a remit that embraces a wide array of conventional and unconventional challenges facing the alliance, including Russia and North Korea, and attendant proliferation in cyber threats, this new office's impact on the alliance's counterterrorism mis mission is necessarily limited and insufficient. The long-standing complaint that only five of the 28 NATO member states spend the required 2% 2 of their GDP on defense, coupled with France and Germany's resistance to any expansion of NATO's counterterrorism mandate beyond the status quo, has severely limited the alliance's role in countering one of the preeminent contemporary threats to the alliance's domestic and collective security. Instead, individual member states pursue tactics and policies designed to manage internal security problems, defend their own borders, and narrowly protect their own citizens. Absent the concerted, genuinely coordinated, and holistic strategy required to better contain this scourge and effectively break the cycle of regeneration that has sustained and nourished successive iterations of Al-Qaeda and produced even more heinous terrorist manifestations such as ISIS. Forty years ago, this coming March, public television stations across the United States <coughs> broadcast a special two-hour documentary featuring 16 international experts titled Terrorism, The World at Bed. The previous week, terrorists had struck in Israel, the Netherlands, <coughs> and Italy in what then was an unprecedented show of force. The separate and uncoordinated attacks occurring in rapid succession had generated worldwide fear and alarm, as few prior terrorists had. We can expect more terrorism, the host Jim Hogue at the time, editor of the Chicago Sun-Times, concluded, 
And we must react, sometimes with bold action, other times with prudent concession. We must cooperate and plan as terrorists do, he continued, and change our responses as they change their techniques. And where there are legitimate grievances, we must work to eliminate them. At all times, we must exercise caution and cunning, not bravado. Overreaction to terrorism is as much to be feared as despair, for at stake are human lives and civil liberties. We have suffered terrorism before, and most likely will again. Transnational terrorists, he ended, will, he ended his uh, conclusion, will not respect our borders, only our resolve. The more it changes, the more it is the same thing, goes Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr's famous 19th century epigram. The same may be said of the transatlantic alliance's response to terrorism today. The current threat environment posed by the emergence and spread of ISIS and the stubborn resilience and long game approach of Al-Qaeda makes a new strategy and new organizational and institutional behavior, behaviors necessary. The non-traditional challenges posed by elusive and deadly irregular adversaries emphasizes the need to anchor changes that will more effectively close the gap between detecting irregular adversarial activity and rapidly countering it. The effectiveness of this strategy will be based on our capacity to think like a networked enemy in anticipation of how they may act in a variety of situations aided by different resources. This goal requires that both NATO and individual American and European national security structures, both individually and collectively, organize themselves for maximum, sufficiency, maximum efficiency, information sharing, and the ability to function quickly and effectively under new operational definitions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all these very thoughtful words. I missed the happy end. Where's the happy end? <laughs> but let me ask you a question before we open it up uh, to questions from the audience. Let's go back to basics. I mean, as you said, terrorism has been around for a long time, will be around for a long time. But uh, is my impression wrong that since the end of the Cold War, since the 1990s, and then, of course, since 9-11, terrorism has become a much more dangerous threat and a, a threat which seems to be uh, existent in many more parts of the world than before the 1990s. If that is so, why is that? Is that just because we are unlucky? Is that just the way it is? Or did the West contribute to the rise of terrorism? Well, I think I think to put it in historical perspective, firstly, the 21st century is profoundly different than previous levels of terrorism. And I think it's profoundly different because of the ubiquity of communications and the rapidity with which one can communicate, the movement of people's goods. Um, I mean, these things I think about transformative effects that means that um, trends and threats develop and new developments, new technologies develop much faster and come online with greater rapidity than they ever had in the past. So that's one difference. So when I think of David Rappaport's seminal work where he talked about four waves of terrorism that were each somewhere in the realm, I believe, like 20 or 30 years, in other words, generational. I think this current wave, because it is a product of the 21st century, will be more sustained. That the changes that we see in it will unfold much more quickly, will catch governments off guard with greater regularity than in the past, will give us less time to respond. Um, but also, I think, will last longer for those reasons. And that this way, I think thus far so, after 16 years, I don't think anybody imagined after the 9-11 attacks that we'd still be fighting this war 16 years later. Or that we'd fi face two formidable adversaries, not just one. And as I described, a, an array of their branches and affiliates uh, scattered um, uh, throughout the world. I think another important factor is that terrorism motivated in previous eras was secular in orientation. Um, it therefore had issues that could be addressed through negotiation, whereas for groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, the United Nations is as much, perhaps, more of an enemy than the United States and the West. 
Um, so I think that's one important difference. Also, I think since the late 1970s, religion has become a much, I write about, of course, extensively in, in, in my book, Inside Terrorism, has become a much larger factor in terrorism than it has been at any time since almost ancient and medieval times, when before the emergence of the nation state and the end of monarchical rule in the 19th and 20th centuries, religion was perhaps the only justification for terrorism, but then it, it reemerged. And I think religion as a power to, to summon, to animate, motivate, and inspire individuals on a much more visceral, personal, and emotional level than abstract ideology has. The violence becomes divinely ordained. And I think what's so interesting is that, obviously I'm talking about contemporary international terrorist threats, so I focused on the Salafi Jihadi threat, but the threat from religious terrorism, that terrorist as it emerged at the end of the 20th century was not confined to any one religious movement. Uh, you had Christian white supremacists justifying <coughs> violence in the United States based on uh, theology and on biblical texts. You had Jewish messianic terrorists uh, um, active um, in, in, in Israel and in the occupied territories. You had emerging idiosyncratic cults like the Om Shariko is responsible for the 1995 uh, Tokyo attacks. All those groups were covered, for instance, in the first and second editions of Inside Terrorism. In the third edition, I actually added yet another religious movement that had escaped my notice early, the Sikh movement in, in India. During the 1970s had been primarily secular, but by the 1980s had become far more religious in motivation, in the content of its, of its, of its treatises and of, and of its propaganda, and of course, Bindran Whaley, who was the leader of the Sikh movement, was himself a rural cleric, and this was, this was very common. Similarly, in Kashmir, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, the Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front had been primarily secular, but by the 1990s it had become much more religious. So we saw this general phenomenon, I think, with the collapse of ideology, the demise of the Soviet Union, the fact that democratic values took longer to take hold in many countries, that was that were, that would then was expected, and also the benefits of the free market economy didn't take root to the extent many had hoped. I think led many more people to embrace religion. Unfortunately, terrorists were able to exploit it. And then you combine that with uh, the social the social media, which has given them this reach and this ability, as I described. <coughs> Not just to put a message out there, almost like you know the proverbial message in a bottle that you hope washes ashore somewhere, and someone opens the bottle and takes out the message. I mean, that was in essence the internet, which seemed like such a revolution a decade ago. Now, social media enables this very direct, very personal communication that has inspired them. Uh, certainly, at the heart of terrorism is a sense of aggrievement and injustice. Um, for reasons, I mean, the colonial era not least, the West is, is blamed for that. Many of the countries that have been beset by violence historically are those that resisted colonial domination and that also in the aftermath of World War II uh, created national liberation movements that used these tactics. Uh, so of course, there's a complex array of reasons, I would argue historical, that give rise to the problems that unfortunately we're facing today because of the power of social media communications and mass movements just on a much more pervasive scale than we've ever had to, to confront them before. Thank you very much. Uh, let's switch off Facebook, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think industry could do a better job that they're doing, and the, the controversy over <coughs> Russia's role in the elections, I think, is, is yet another manifestation. Again, of the rapidity with which these new technologies take hold, or sometimes I think in the past, not sometimes, in the past, I think we've been oblivious to some of the consequences or manifestations. I mean, I'm old enough to remember in the early 1990s when the internet was touted and widely believed to be this engine of education and enlightenment, but these days it seems to be rather the purveyor of some of the coarsest conspiracy theories, messages of hatred and intolerance, and also manipulations of, 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 of many uh, Western democracies as well. So are you uh, optimistic at all that terrorism and that wider definition can be contained at least in a way that not entire countries are being taken over so that, you know, terrorism will never disappear, but can it be contained much more than it seems to be at the moment? Well, 41 years of studying terrorism since I first went to graduate school in 1976 is not calculated to make someone an enduring optimist. <laughs> but at the same time, the terrorism has clearly gotten worse, but at the same time, I think you hit the nail on the head. As a strategic threat, it is, 
it is fortunately had a very poor track record. Um, what worries me though is that even though um, terrorists, you know, have rarely come to power historically. Uh, rely on violence alone, unless they've reneged on violence and entered into peace processes and negotiations. That, that's, of course, different. I, so, I think, well, that hasn't happened, and I don't want to, like, present, I think, a very pessimistic picture. I don't want to be alarmist about that. I don't think that's going to happen. I think the pain that terrorists are capable of inflicting on our societies, unfortunately, has increased in the 21st century, and largely because of the the internationalization, the lone wolf phenomena, conscious choices that the terrorists have made. I think what worries me the most is that we're stepping into the terrorist trap. The terrorists, whether it's ISIS or Al-Qaeda, know that they could never defeat us, much less even our smallest allies on the military battle, with some, ex some exceptions. I mean, in places like Yemen, Al-Qaeda never even been to a swarm of the Yemeni government's military forces. But the point is, I, they, they know they can't defeat us militarily. What they are trying to do is corrode our core values mm -hmm. um, and have this enormous corrosive effect. And we see this happening, not just in the United States, as in, but in other countries, as, as, as nativism, as, I think, very simplistic solutions that are clawing back of fundamental liberties that make our societies and, and cultures what they are. Um, it's perhaps the most dangerous threat we face, and that's why I argue we have to take the threat of terrorism seriously because they're trying to crumble us from within. And that's exactly what the law said in 2004. Thank you very much. On this optimistic note, let me <laughs> open the discussion. Yes, please, the lady here. Hi, good evening. Thank you maybe, for coming. Maybe take that microphone. I'll take it this time. <laughs> Hello, my name's Michelle. Thank you for coming to speak with us this evening. Um, my question is more about when terrorist organizations take on nationalistic causes and the R, R is the West, the foreign policy terrorism funding that goes into that. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is in the Sahel and in Somalia as, as case studies, when you have a lot of funding going into weak governments, into weak countries for counter-terror and for a strong security response, um, sometimes that takes away from addressing domestic problems that are leading to the issue to begin with. Um, so I was wondering what your recommendations are on that and if you're seeing a positive change. Well, interestingly, I think all terrorists throughout history claim that they're nationalists, even the Red Army faction, the Badr Minoff group, who I would label as revolutionary left-wing terrorists. I mean, they style themselves as the true nationalists that were that purported to save uh, Germany. So all terrorists, I think, use, the, use that, that label. But I think you've hit on a very important term. Very important issue that has repeatedly surfaced over the past decade and a half is that throwing money at problems sometimes makes the problems greater. Or throwing mo money at areas beset by conflict without understanding that not only does it have to be oriented towards kinetic activities, in other words, diminishing the power of terrorists, but has to fundamentally recalibrate those societies to bring greater justice, greater uh, economic development. In other words, to address the issues that the terrorists themselves capitalize on and constantly regenerating and resurrecting themselves is absolutely pivotal. Otherwise, we're going to be locked into a treadmill of forever fighting these types of, of struggles. That's why I argue that we need, I think, a more coordinated and comprehensive than what is often just a piecemeal approach to the problem. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Yes, please, David. Thank you, David Lynn. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer and an alumnus of UNC. I work in Chapel Hill now. Um, I, I hope you could take the conversation now from here out to give us your reflections on how governments should adapt policies in order to break this cycle, in order to prevent the, uh, apparently they are very, the terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda and, and uh, the Islamic State, are very successful in the bumper sticker, be afraid, be very afraid. And it's exactly what we're doing. We have the photographs here which show that we are afraid and very afraid. So what, what, what are the policies that, aside from NATO, that international communities can adopt in order to change the cognitive perception about the level of the threat and then to deal with the, exactly those kinds of um, the, the lack of governance in places where they are now thriving and able to, to, um, to uh, at least uh, hide out, train, recruit, get money, and so on and so forth. 
Well, I mean, certainly the thrust of your question, I think, is one of the problems that has existed in terrorism from, you know, from, from time immemorial, from when it was created, is that it has a disproportionate impact on people compared to other risks that they have to live with. I mean, terrorism, especially in the United States, is one of the smallest risks, probably, in terms of more people are killed lightning strikes, for example, by their dogs, but we don't see people being afraid to go outside when it's raining or getting rid of their pets, for instance. But the reaction that terrorism triggers is often disproportionate to the threat. But that's why terrorism exists, and that's why terrorists seize upon it. But I think, on the one hand, dismissing it isn't right, because I think the citizens of any country anywhere expect their government to defend them, and expect, especially in the United States over the past decade and a half, when so many billions have been spent on counterterrorism, expect the responses to be, um, to be very effective. Um, you know, when I look back at the past decade and a half, I think that we've, we've swung between two extremes, the one that military force was the solution to everything, but then another extreme that you could do counter-narratives, kill some of the terrorist leaders, hold the threat at bay, and that didn't work either. I think as in most things in life, it's a combination of the two. I mean, for me, looking at what one of the main problems is today is the sanctuaries and safe havens that terrorists have. Um, I quoted the National Counterterrorism Center that ISIS, even despite the fall of Iraq, uh, it's, it's, its bastion in, in, in Iraq, and now in Syria, still has a presence in nearly 18 countries throughout the world. Al-Qaeda, as I said, is in, 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 in two dozen. So it has to be, I think, a combination of the kinetics that weakens their power and deprive, or deprives them of the sanctuaries and safe havens because that enables them to attract recruits, to dispatch people on missions. It also gives, I think, lone wolves sort of, it takes what's otherwise an abstract cause but gives them an actual destination that the Islamic State, for instance, or the caliphate that they can aspire to. So I think that's an important element. But I think a lot of the cooperation that existed in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 has eroded. These groups cannot exi exist without financing and without state enablers. And certainly the latest tranche of, I think, 300,000 plus documents that were released from the materials that the U.S. Navy SEALs uh, seized in Abbottabad from Bin Laden's complex show just how much state sponsorship and state enabling of terrorism has continued. So it's certainly, I think, some of the resolution that we saw during the Cold War and even in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 against the sponsors and enablers of terrorism and facilitators is extremely important as well, as well as the counter-finance. And we were very good a decade plus ago at cutting off the source of charitable contributions and foundations to terrorists. But they didn't lay down there, they didn't quit. They found new ways, and this antiquities, oil, gas, um, Human trafficking, of course, is a huge element. I mean, all these things that are inherent goods in combating to begin with because of the exploitation of people, um, I think is, is very important. But as I said, that common framework, I think, is eroded, and we all think that we can approach the issue, uh, I, I just think, in a very disparate way, which only succeeds in sort of, uh, you know, keeping it at bay without having, I think, the progress that we really need. And I think for the times over the past decade and a half, there was profound progress against these groups. But then, I think a combination of wishful thinking, of precipitously declaring victory, resulted that we took our foot off the accelerator. Bin Laden's death, for example, I think convinced many people that this threat had ended, only to see ISIS emerge. And I think we have to realize that this is, unfortunately, terrorism has become one of the many security issues that we have to worry about and can't although we're distracted by many other ones, but that we can't, uh, we can't take our attention off of it and have to remain focused. And that in itself, we know how to fight terrorism. I mean, this is historically, you can look at the lessons of other countries and know what not to do and what to do. Now, one of my pet peeves as a terrorism analyst is that unfortunately the terrorists are a lot better learners than governments are. They have to, otherwise they don't survive. So we can harness that ability, but I think it requires a, a commitment that's much more difficult now because we're tired after a decade and a half of fighting. We're beset with many other threats. Russia, North Korea, proliferation, cyber security and, so, uh, and cyber threats. So it's very difficult. But one sees just like last week, uh, tragically in New York on Halloween, that a terrorist incident once again is catapulted onto the front pages dominates the news cycle, generates worldwide publicity. Also, I have to say, distracts our attention from more important issues, and that in and of itself is a reason 
why I think we need greater resolve to really address and tackle the problem now and not just let it carry on the way it is indefinitely. Thank you. The US government has criticized the lack of defense spending by the Europeans. Does that also apply to the European effort regarding uh, counterinsurgency and anti-terrorism, or would you say that the Europeans are making quite a good effort? Uh, well, as I, as I said in the presentation, a lot of the, um, the training, I think, is not part of a, a wider, broader strategy that would have systemic effects and would also be more, I think, greater focus and almost uh, what the counterinsurgency was, uh, you know, the oil spot strategy of the French would target one area and then build outwards, would I think have greater long-term effects rather than the sort of short-term focus that I think typifies the responses. Now, where progress is made, and, 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 and look, I, I worked with the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq in 2004 and with the Multinational Force Headquarters in 2005 as well. I know that any progress in these environments is herculean. Any achievement that you can do as part of an alliance, especially working with indigenous forces, is, is enormously significant. But that's part of the problem. We shouldn't be blinded by tactical advances and believe that we've turned a corner on the overall threat, which in my view remains unfortunately intractable and is corroding, as I, I'll go back to my earlier, is corroding our societies because we're not facing it. So yes, on an individual basis, there are significant contributions, but there's not that, that sense of unity that I think there needs to be. Thank you. Yes, um, yes, the lady here. Hi, Professor Bruce. Thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. My name is Patricia. I'm a visiting scholar here at the Carolina Population Center and a PhD candidate in, at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. My question is, uh, you mentioned a lot the importance of the social media and internet on how terrorist groups can achieve their targets right now, they can knock their doors and pass a message and recruit them. My question is, um, regarding the transatlantic alliance and the responses given, how uh, the transatlantic partners are dealing with the, the people that are being recruited? I mean, in my view, it seems like, especially in Europe, that those terrorists in Europe, they are European citizens. So maybe there is a failure of Europe to integrate them, to make them feel European. And in the other hand, you have this um, terrorist messages sending them another project, an alternative project of belonging. So how is the Western project to those people and how are the answers target to avoid new recruiters to um, terrorist groups being done. Thank you. Well, it's, it, it amazes me this, this, this long into the war on terrorism I don't have an answer to, to any of those very good points that, that, that you made. Um, you know, we talk about a counter narrative, but obviously it hasn't had much impact if 40,000 persons from around the world, from over 100 countries, you know, volunteered for, for ISIS. Um, I mean, certainly a sense of exclusion, a sense of alienation and disenfranchisement is part of it. But then, I always think too that terrorism, you know, is, it, it's an individual choice in many respects, and it's often very idiosyncratic. And I think of, in Germany in the early 1980s, for example, there was this immensely detailed four-volume study of terrorism, it was what the English translation would be terrorism and ideology, mm -hmm. that was undertaken with a very homogeneous Sample. I mean, it was basically West German terrorists who were almost all from middle class or upper middle class backgrounds, who were all the same religion, the same ethnic background, um, roughly had the same socioeconomic uh, profile. And in these four volumes, they couldn't come up with a common denominator of why people were radicalized and became terrorists. So we're talking now about a vast array of all sorts of reasons, I think, unfortunately motivate and animate people to become terrorists. That doesn't mean that our search should be tireless, and it doesn't mean that this is an important component of countering terrorism. But at the same time, in and of itself, I think the results can only be, um, can only go so far because we're talking about individuals. Right now, I would say across Europe, well, especially in the United Kingdom, uh, because of the, the, uh, the, the 
the number of incidents. I think there were five successful attacks this past year out of 12 attempts, so seven more were forwarded as well. There is an effort to um, curtail the use of social media and the use of, of, of the internet to a greater extent uh, than before. And that's part of the solution, but in and of itself, it's not going to be an answer until you can address some of the more socioeconomic reasons that have driven people to terrorism. But then, you know, then sometimes I throw up my hands. I mean, in certain places, you do have people, certainly from the lower, lower strata of society, menial jobs, not having a place in society. But then, you know, you look in places like the United Kingdom, where graduates of the London School of Economics or King's College, uh, London, um, people from highly privileged backgrounds, and nonetheless, you gravitated towards towards terrorism. So that's why there can't be one answer. I think all these initiatives coming from all these different directions, which again goes back to why you need a strategy to coordinate it all, at least to focus it all, is, is, is so important. Thank you. We have a scholar from King's College London here. We will ask him later what happened. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman over there. Yeah. Hey, thank you again for the lecture. <clears throat> um, my question concerns... Put on uh, for the microphone. Oh. Uh, my question uh, concerns the uh, expansion and effectiveness of the U.S. drone policy. Um, how, is that, um, how effective has it been in combating terrorism? And do you see an increase in the U.S. government carrying out targeted drone strikes against American citizens abroad? Or was the uh, event where uh, Anwar al-Awlaki was targeted by the Obama administration, his son was targeted, and his daughter was recently killed in a commando strike, was that a one-off event? Uh, or do you see these type of uh, strikes increasing in the future? Firstly, innocent civilians are innocent civilians, whether they're Yemenis, Americans, Muslims, Jews, Christians, whatever. I mean, so there's an inherent wrong in, killing, in collateral casualties, which makes me very concerned about drones, drone strikes because they're only as effective as the intelligence. Secondly, I, I argued back to the, the time that Anwar al awlaki was killed in September 2011 that uh, Killing American citizens abroad, no matter what the reasons, is a very dangerous slope. I almost think it's very similar to the use of enhanced interrogation techniques, also known as torture, a decade and a half ago, where that was done for what was seen at the time, for very valid reasons, where there was no alternative, but at the same time, I think, led us down a path that many lament. And I think, you know, uh, targeting American citizens and depriving them of due process is, 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 a, very, is, is a very serious move that has, I think, far-reaching consequences that I find very unsettling. That said, like any weapon, if used effectively, if based on accurate intelligence, drones can be a way of obviating or mitigating the use of ground forces or special operations forces to target terrorists um, in very difficult, difficult locations. Um, they have certainly, I think, when they have targeted the people they've meant to kill, and when they have avoided collateral casualties, have had a, have had a very positive effect. I think one of the mistakes, though, that we made in the United States in recent years is that we confused the tactic with a strategy. And although it may have been good at forcing terrorists to pay more attention to their own security than to planning terrorist attacks, whereas it may have eliminated key terrorist leaders, <coughs> At the end of the day, it, has, it fundamentally hasn't recalibrated the battlefield in any sense. ISIS and Al-Qaeda have still spread. Again, it's one tool of many, but it's a tool that I think has to be very carefully and very surgically applied. I think it's another weapon in our arsenal, but like all weapons, it has to be pointed at the right target and discriminately. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Me? Yeah, brief question. Oh, yeah. Um, the microphone's okay. the microphone. I don't. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll try to make this as quick as I can. You say that Italy is doing a better job of combating terrorism than uh, America. This is the case. What is America doing wrong that Italy is doing right? I don't think I said that. Oh, because you just said Italy did something with Morocco at the very beginning of your talk? At the very beginning, yeah. That, oh, well, <laughs> right. No, Italy, oh, I see what you mean. Okay. No, that, that's a fair point. Um, no, Italy was... A, effective in, um, in breaking up that cell, uh, largely because of, uh, of signals intercepts that led to it, and good intelligence on the ground. Uh, I think they were, they, were just, they were just fortunate, that's all one can say. Everything came together for them in disrupting that ISIS cell to an extent that hasn't been the case elsewhere. I would say, generally speaking, 
Italy has a less pervasive radicalization problem and certainly has sent far fewer foreign fighters to Iraq or Syria than other countries such as France, Belgium, the United Kingdom, even Sweden has sent. So I think Italy itself has been wrestling with less of a systemic problem than perhaps some other European countries, and this enabled their security and intelligence forces to be more focused with their counterterrorism operations, and fortunately were able to disrupt this particular plot. Thank you. Yeah, the gentleman over there. Right at the yeah. How you doing, uh, Nate Bowers from National Defense University? Just wanted to ask, uh, in terms of the, the social media problem, do you see that as a state problem or a private industry? I mean, we're already seeing uh, some of the leaks from the changing of algorithms in Google and YouTube, but how do you, how do you see this, uh, this problem best being tackled? It has to, well, the preferable outcome is that private industry, as they are now do, I mean, certainly Facebook, Google, all these, uh, these uh, platforms, have dedicated units, YouTube, that are taking down this material and are doing so, I think, much more actively than they had in the past. That's not to say that there wasn't cooperation before, but the elephant in the room is Edward Snowden, because, of course, Snowden revealed, amongst many other things, to some extent, the, just what that cooperation entailed, and I think it made many companies very skittish of cooperating with the government. I mean, we're in a very different position now, um, not least because Britain, for example, has taken a very active role in attempt and even threatening legal action against them. And there's much more progress because, of course, all of these platforms have existing algorithms and protocols for taking down child pornography and the trafficking in, in, in children, for example. I think now, rightly, the attempt is being made to apply lots of those same techniques and a lot of, a lot of that same technology against radicalization and against terrorism. Um, where, for instance, an ISIS logo could be removed from a message as quickly, let's say, as child pornography is. But that's only a very recent development. And only after, I think, the, uh, the skittishness, as I said, from the Snowden affair has died down, and also as the threat rose in Europe, and the demands for action grew, then Silicon Valley became more responsive. Thank you. Lloyd, yeah? Thank you. I appreciate your uh, wide-ranging perspectives. I wanted to ask you if you could give us a little better idea of what you think the goal of terrorists really is. In the past, there were always uh, movements, uh, anti-colonial movements, nationalist movements, uh, socialist, communist movements that resorted to violence, but with a clear goal, usually within their own country. What is it that terrorists think they can achieve in their own world? I say, for example, encouraging an attack on the streets of New York City um, that would lead them toward a specific outcome. I, I, I think this is one of the things that baffles people as compared to other eras of um, militant violent activities within particular colonial societies or nationalist movements, or even revolutions? Well, much as I just criticized some aspects of government waging of war and terrorism that we've misinterpreted tactical successes and strategic victories, I think that's exactly the world that terrorists live in, and that they see these types of attacks and the attention that they get from these attacks as making them more relevant, making them powerful, and it feeds, I think, their own uh, often self-delusional impressions that they are actually making progress in creating this environment of fear and anxiety that they can continue to manipulate and exploit that eventually will lead to the capit capitulation of governments in the face of their demands. So, I mean, Bin Laden himself, with the 9-11 attacks, believed that by striking four symbols of American power, finance, military, and, and political, that this would somehow cause the United States to completely change its foreign policy, to stop its support for Israel, for example, not to intervene in any foreign conflicts uh, abroad and, and adopt a much more isolationist policy. And I think that's part of the problem is that terrorists live in a fantasy world. They believe their own propaganda. I mean, they, they do exist in an echo chamber. Of course, how could they ever have joined a terrorist group and believe that this violence could confront superpowers, for example, but not only superpowers, established nation states, and that they would ever be successful? They have to believe that someday these incremental 
acts of violence will cumulatively come together and deliver them the power that they want, uh, the control that they want to be able to, 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 uh, to, um, to determine their own destiny. I mean, I think what's often remarkable about these groups is they, uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda included, have almost make-believe constituencies. They believe that their support is far more extensive and far more pervasive than it actually is. And that sustains them. And unfortunately, they then interpret media coverage as validation that they matter or that they're important. And that has become, I think, the single most important factor of why these groups believe that attacks, especially that, cost them nothing. Individuals that they've had no contact with, so even if they're apprehended, like the perpetrator in New York, have very little actual information. He can't tell anything about ISIS. If he's willing to, he may be able to explain how he himself was radicalized, but that's, that's worth. But it's become a very low-cost way of, of attacking and, and harming their opponents. I mean, this goes back to something that, that, that Klaus had said earlier. I also think that there's a very strong element in this, even though I've emphasized the religious element, which I think is important, but you know, that's, in terrorism there's never one sole source or generator of, of, of terrorism, but Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth from the 1950s I think is enormously important, at least for ISIS in particular, the sense that violence is self-validating, that there's a sense of catharsis, of striking this, this blow, this, a satisfying blow against one's enemy. In and of itself, that's what also animates terrorists, but they believe that that's one more step down the road that they will eventually get power. But for the, for the interim, for the short term, just that use of violence is sufficient for their own purposes. Thank you. Um, the gentleman there, yeah. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Professor. Um, my name is Miles. I'm a senior in Peace War Defense here at uh, Chapel Hill. And I have a question about uh, how you frame nuclear terrorism, um, the threat, and where the, the threat is coming from. Uh, and Graham Allison, to, his conception is that it's almost inevitable. Um, Brian Jenkins from RAND talks more about the distinction between nuclear terror a fear of potential nuclear terrorism being more effective versus the actual possibility of nuclear terrorist attack. So, just get your take on that. Well, the aphorism, low likelihood, high consequence, would, would kind of sum it up. I don't believe that it's likely, but also the threat is that it, it isn't it nil. It, 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 is, it is something that we know from the past. Now, the Iraq WMD may have been a chimera, and may have you know, been a, a false, certainly a false presumption for the invasion of Iraq. But there's absolutely no doubt that prior to 9-11, Al-Qaeda was engaged in research and development across the entire spectrum of, of chemical, biological, radiological, and even nuclear weapons. Now, they were perhaps two or three years away from weaponizing anthrax, a biological weapon. They certainly had stockpiles of chemical weapons. Uh, their nuclear ambitions, I would put, you know, not even in the half-baked, but maybe in the 10th or the 20th or the 150th baked realm. Um, they were certainly serious about it. They invited Pakistani scientists. Um, Bin Laden in the 1990s has sent his minions out to, and this is the good news, even with all the money that he had, he'd sent them out to attempt to buy a, a, a nuclear bomb from someone on the black market. It was none, or to get um, enriched uranium or plutonium. They couldn't get it. In fact, they got some junk called red mercury that they ripped off. So that, was a, that was a positive story. That he was money for. But, I mean, you know, I think it certainly would be within their ambitions, and the proliferation of nuclear weapons to rogue states is certainly worrisome. Um, the fact that a lot of these tactical weapons are moved around on a daily basis in some of these countries, and obviously, um, Goods like that are more dangerous when they're in transit than when they're heavily guarded. Um, so it's not something that I, that, that, that I discount, but I would still put it, fortunately, at the, at the lower rungs of what we have to worry about. But, you know, this is, I think, the problem in, in, with, 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 with terrorism is that terrorists are, are serial opportunists. Any opportunity that's presented to them, they will take advantage of, and that's why it's so important not to ever present them anything close to the opportunity. Because I think, in their desire, that would you know be the ultimate weapon that they would certainly love to acquire. Thank you. I warned you. I told you there would be many questions. Are you still going strong? 
<laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, the lady over there at the end, yeah? Thank you for your talk. It's been excellent. I've learned so much. Thank you. I just have a question. What recommendations do you have to strengthen the United Nations' role in combating terrorism? Well, the United Nations has long played an active role in counterterrorism, especially with, I think, very significant treaties and international agreements about the protection of diplomats, for example, and aviation security in the, in the, in the 1970s. Uh, in, just before 9-11, and then it was enacted after, after those attacks, it specified in its definition of terrorism the targeting of civilians, which I think is a very important step forward. But like any international body that has nearly 200 members, it's very difficult to, I think, continue the unity that did exist a decade more ago, especially in counterfinancing. I think the United Nations was uh, enormously successful. I mean, the United Nations, too, one has to understand, has been the target of terrorism. Uh, for a decade, certainly, but even more so uh, in the 21st um, century. Uh, it has an important role, but I think much like the Western Alliance, it has to recapture some of the momentum that it had immediately after 9-11, which I think is enormously difficult to do given this you know, plethora of threats that we, that we face today. Um, it is an important role, but from my, my perspective, the UN's activities in counterterrorism have been progressively downgraded over the past decade or so and has to be resumed and they have to have this place of leadership. I mean, that's one reason why UN diplomats are targeted, because they were effective. I mean, Sergio De Melo's uh, uh, murder at the Canal Hotel at, in, in August 2003 was a stunning blow to the efforts to stabilize Iraq and rebuild Iraq after, after the invasion. It was, a, it was a tremendous setback. That's precisely why Abu Musab al-Zarqawi targeted him to drive the UN out. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, sir, my name is uh, Corey Rose. I'm a uh, J. Summer student from Fort Frank. Uh, so my question is, um, you know, majority, what you, your, most of your talk talked about these terrorist organizations, their safe havens, their finance is all really kind of housed in the Middle East. So my question would be is, when, how long and do you think it's feasible based off of Trump's foreign policy and his discussion with Saudi Arabia, his his trip to the Middle East that the Middle Eastern the Middle Eastern countries need to come together and band together to police their own. Is this you're talking about 16 years of war has been on the forefront of these people, um, the the civilians, the families that have been killed in devastation. How long do we, do we did it take for them to really kind of band together and, and start fighting themselves? Well, this goes back to my point about you know a unified response because right now exactly some of the countries you described are heavily divided. I mean, Saudi Arabia and the, the Gulf Emirates are in a form of cold war with Qatar, for example, over precisely this issue. Of course, you know we, I've focused mostly on the Salafi jihadi threat, which is a Sunni one, but the threat from uh, Hezbollah, from Shia militias, for instance, in Iraq, from Iran's assertion of power in the region. Uh, is another profound threat, which makes, I think, a lot of this cooperation uh, very difficult. Um, I, don't have, I don't have an easy answer for you, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it has to, I think, uh, part, I mean, it has to begin there, but part of it is what I think many, you know, especially in Iraq is, uh, and in Afghanistan as well, is an inconsistent commitment on the part of the international community in the United States as well to see this through to its end. I think that there were several breakpoints where we had nearly achieved what we had set out to do in both countries, but then uh, we became impatient and we you know, allowed them to slide back into the problems that we face again today. But clearly having these partners help is involved or more in front than the United States forces as controversial as the Trump administration's policies may be with other countries. I mean, this is something though that I think is widely accepted by terrorism experts is absolutely imperative. And I think, too, the counterterrorism strategy that will emerge from the National Security Council will very much address precisely this issue. And it's been gestating for some months now. But it very much speaks to that, that the United States is a willing participant and supporter in this struggle, but it can't be shouldering the burden itself or shouldering the main burden. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. The, uh 
the uh, President Eisenhower uh, warned us about the uh, uh, military industrial complex uh, and now we've seen the, that complex grow to uh, the expense that we have in the budget is like we, as much as the next six countries uh, since 9-11 with the Patriot Act with the expansion of the NSA and its work uh, some people have warned, start to warn us about the yeah, cyber intel complex. Uh, what's your understanding of the size of that complex now, and, and where is it going? Well, I mean, two things. Firstly, it's vast and it has grown. We didn't have a Department of Homeland Security 16 years ago, for example. Certainly, the intelligence budgets have increased after there was a tremendous degradation of intelligence and defense budgets in the 1990s, which may have contributed to some of the problems in this century. Uh, in terms of, so clearly, you know, there's more government spending, although I have to say there's less now than there was 10 years ago, that it hasn't been one of unparalleled growth and expansion, if anything. I would say over the past, uh, certainly seven or eight years, there's been a climb back and there's been less growth than there has been in the past, or less rapid, rapid growth. But I have to say, what concerns me the most isn't, isn't the, the military industrial complex in this sense, or you mentioned cyber. It's the amount of information, personal information, that is out there in private hands. I mean, I trust the government more than private corporations who have more information. I've been a victim of now the Yahoo, um, uh, the, the, the Yahoo hack, the Equifax hack, um, which I think are enormously consequential. And this is part of the problem, is that we understand what the government collects, and often prudent measures are, are taken, or at least there's a debate, for instance, over Section 702 you know, of, of, of the Intelligence Act that enables a lot of collection of information. There's almost no debate about what we sign over and what private corporations do. That, to me, has actually become one of the biggest threats that we face today. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Hi, uh, I guess I'll add another thank you uh, for your talk today. Um, in turn, what you were mentioning before, uh, difficulties in maintaining relationships, and the uh, title here, Align Responses, there seems to have been a drift since the invasion of Iraq, the Snowden revelations, and the most recent uh, administration between uh, the U.S. and its European partners. Uh, do you see that drift being particularly severe? And if so, do you see that as any kind of impediment <coughs> to collective action on specifically the terrorism issue inside the alliance? I think the drift has been severe because, now, and part of that, you know, has to be laid at the feet of the United States, too, because in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, the United States sort of, you know, put out its hand with Europe and said, we'll be, we'll be in control. And I think the sort of the true cooperation that, that many of our European allies expected didn't materialize. But that said, I think, the killing of Bin Laden, for example, um, the belief that, firstly, that Al-Qaeda, because it's quiet, no longer is threatening. The fact that because ISIS lost its caliphate in Iraq and now with most of Syria, that the threat has receded, I think creates a, creates a, a situation where sometimes wishful thinking rather than hard analysis has taken hold and understandably has, res, has resulted in a dim, d diminishment of budgets, uh, decline of interest, a lower prioritization of the struggle against terrorism. But I think what we've seen in the past two years since the Paris attacks is that the terrorist capacity to inflict pain in our societies is undiminished and remains, and also the consequences, consequences of it on our values, on our sense of well-being, are much greater than it's ever been, which means, I think, this persistent vigilance against terrorism is more important than ever. Okay. Thank you again for your talk, Professor. Um, I wanted to ask you about your take on uh, historic state sponsors of terrorism, such as Iran's interventions in Iraq and Syria, as they have armed their own extremist militias to fight against them. How do you think we should deal with the awkwardness that kind of ensues from that? Thank you. Well, I think 
speaking of wishful thinking from the start, I think there was an assumption that Iran would not see the presence of large numbers of U.S. forces and of other Western troops in Iraq straddling its border as an immense challenge and threat that they were just going to be passive about it. And I can say from the time certainly I was in Iraq 13 years ago, we knew that Iranian agents and Iranian money was all over the place um, to build their information networks and also to protect their interests and also to, you know, sort of, ex as the Pakistanis describe it, extend their strategic depth outside of Iran into Iraq. And in some respects, I think that this has come to fruition in, 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 um, to a large extent. Um, you know, we have to choose our enemies and choose our struggles and harness our capabilities where they make the most sense and whether Iran is the right threat to take on right now. It's fortunately above my pay grade, but I'm not in government, so I don't have to decide that. But I think it's one of the fundamental questions and very formidable challenges that we face. I mean, on a conventional level, Iraq, Iran is not, is not a military threat, but it's certainly its influence and its subversive capacity is as undiminished as, it, as it's ever been. You know, I was, um, for, for many years, was a consultant to the Argentine Supreme Court and Congress uh, in respect of their um, investigations into the 19, 1992 bombing of the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires and then two years later of the Jewish Community Center. And there was, from the evidence that I saw, Argentina has its own raft of complications as well, including the suspicious death of the lead prosecutor just last year, but from everything that I saw, there was a clear Iranian involvement that Iran had an international terrorist capability in the form of Hezbollah or the Revolutionary Guards that it could activate when it needed to. That it, I wrote this in a, an Iran report that I published in 1990, that Iran views terrorism as an instrument to foreign policy, to be used when it's needed or when there perhaps isn't any other resort, but then not to be used when it doesn't suit them. And I think this remains certainly a threat or a challenge, but it's not the most immediate or the most active one that, from the terrorism dimension that the United States faces. Thank you. We are running out of time, but we would have time for a few more questions. For example, Brian. Mm -hmm. My name is Brian Keeler. Thank you very much uh, for your talk there. Um, you say it's beneath your, no, it's above your pay grade. And I think if we were to have an election here, most of us would vote for you to do, to do something about this very bleak picture. So, here you are, you've studied it this long, you've got to give us some kind of message uh, or something we should be doing as a country and, and as a community to do something about this because, as you pointed out, we're not going to sleep very well tonight unless you tell us something. <laughs> Well, my answer isn't a very popular one because it's one that both well, the Secretary of Defense, uh, General Mattis, or the entire General Mattis embraced, but also General McMaster, is that sometimes in certain circumstances, I think, that you need to deploy military force to prevent a group like ISIS from embedding itself for three plus years in a place like. Iraq and the border with, with Syria and having this Sinoshore, this, this, this focus that, um, of this proto-state that I think enhance their brand and enhance their power and enables them, even without the state now, to harken back to its resurrection as still being a compelling, um, a, a compelling, uh, uh, com compelling uh, motivation for future terrorism. So I would argue that, um, you know, as I said earlier, we veered between Military force is the solution to everything, and invading countries is part of that. To carry violent extremism, to special operations forces and drones, as most things in life, it's a combination of factors. That deploys military forces for much more limited engagements, but very quickly reduces the power and the presence of terrorists. But then all that's going to be to naught, and we're going to just be running around the world doing that, unless we have this ability to address some of the fundamental grievances and to improve the capabilities of indigenous forces to police themselves afterwards. But that's not just a product of security, it's also of recalibrating, I think, the, um, the societal imbalances that have become feeding grounds for, for terrorism. So, it's, you know, when you, when you look about it, when you look at it, um, the Obama and the Trump approaches to counterterrorism haven't radically differed. I mean, in many cases, the Trump administration, 
they've given commanders a bit more latitude on the ground. There have been more special operations raids, perhaps, some of them, as the earlier questioner pointed out, that have had lamentable outcomes, or mistaken outcomes, unfortunately, um, that resulted in the deaths of, of U.S. forces. But the policies have remained remarkably <coughs> consistent. I mean, and I think they're sensible policies, but the problem is they play into this war of attrition that's just going to drag on, and I think something more decisive is needed. Now, this is something that I said, Secretary Mattis and the NSC advisor, uh, McMaster, had advocated, but the President, as I think reflecting the collective will of the country, doesn't want any military engagements apart from very limited ones, full stop, and that one has to respect, but I think my concern is that I think that leads us into just being enmeshed in the struggle for another 16 years, and I'm not sure we can, we can sustain that. So how do we understand the contradiction between that fire and fury about North Korea and that hesitation to use military force uh, against terrorism? Well, I wouldn't say it's a hesitation uh, on, on the current administration. I think it's a continuation of many of the Obama administration's policies and that um, even some of the the more febrile rhetoric, for instance, surrounding immigrants, you do not see, at least in the drafts of the National Counterterrorism Strategy, which, don't forget, there was, there was an iteration in 2003 and 2006, and the last one was 2011. So I think it's absolutely right that the circumstances have changed, different en enemies, different deployments overseas, we need a new strategy. At least, and you can look it up, I think, Thomson Reuters, actually, in April, somehow got a copy of it, and uh, my understanding is that was fairly accurate. I mean, this was, there will be, people will disagree with elements of it, but it was a remarkably sober document that had none of some of the overheated rhetoric that we hear in political discourse, and did have, I think, a very holistic and a very coordinated strategy. I, mean, I thought it was a very clear eyed view on how to, on, on how to counter terrorism. Um, so right there is a, is a vast, divergence between what's said on the political stump or on a political platform and what actually is happening. Which, you know, in a, in a lecture that was overly pessimistic, may be like a kernel of optimism. <laughs> of course, we've seen that, uh, the same today with China. Think of the campaign statements, think of what he's saying in China today. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Conrad, there was a question. Well, I don't want to drag it out any longer. Uh, I've always been puzzled by a contradiction. The West is the big enemy of many of the terrorists, and yet they're using all sorts of Western weapons, technologies and other things which they are not generating from the inside. I mean, how does that work for the terrorist mindset that they're having to use Western stuff in order to defeat the West, and how do they think they're ever going to do it? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. I Tina Brown, who's often very good you know, putting these things together, once described the marriage of a sixth century ideology, referring to Ibn Tamiya, who was one of the main theologians and ideologues that both Al-Qaeda and ISIS revere, um, you know, with 21st century technology that has, that has created a tinderbox. And you're right about the paradox. I mean, think about it. The Taliban or Al-Shabaab. I would say, in terms of what we view as sophisticated adversaries, pretty much at the bottom. That's not to say they're not formidable fighters. But they're certainly not using high-tech weaponry. They're certainly not the most sophisticated groups. But even they have harnessed modern 21st century technology in their service with Twitter accounts. During our you know, involvement in Afghanistan, the Taliban was often, at least until General Petraeus took over, was often faster in getting their messages out and their interpretation of events, which was often a very misleading and malignant one, faster than ISAF could or that the United States commanders could. So, I mean, in their view, they're using these technologies against us almost uh, gleefully in the sense that they are able to turn the, the tables on us and weaken us with our with with our own technological advances and our own progress, and you know, from a terrorist point of view, you know, any weapon that works is is, is one that they will embrace, which is 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 why you know the earlier question about nuclear terrorism is unlikely as it is, it can't be completely discounted because if they had access to it, I have no doubt that, that it would be used, or at least would be used to threaten us, certainly. Thank you. I'm wondering whether we should give the final question to a student here. Anyone? Any volunteers? 
Right, then let me ask you whether you can give us some optimistic uh, message for going away. Because there have been some movements, uh, some uh, um, uh, yeah, movements in Northern Ireland, in Peru and elsewhere, where terrorist movements were maybe not defeated, but where compromises were achieved and an integration of terrorist movements took place. Can we use some of these lessons to apply them against ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda? I think it would be hard to find common ground to negotiate with ISIS, especially and probably Al-Qaeda, but I think some of the lessons are applicable. In none of these places did the terrorist groups come willingly to the table. Uh, they were beaten kinetically and militarily, firstly, um, but even, well, not even, equally as importantly, their constituencies shrank as well, and they found that their messages had less resonance and they had less support, which I think are the timeless lessons of countering terrorism is that it's not an either or, it's both kinetic and non kinetic but it has to be in service, I think, to this, as I've described, coordinated holistic strategy, which unfortunately we rarely see, but when we do see it, it does produce, I think, signal results. Now, given my abiding pessimism after studying terrorism, one has to step back for a second and say, as tremendous as it is that there is now a peace in Colombia, at least between the FARC and the Colombian government. Don't forget the FARC was created in 1964. So that means we shouldn't be under any illusions that it isn't a long struggle that has to be sustained and pursued and has to adapt and adjust to the new threats and new challenges that terrorists present us. But I think it's a very important and an excellent ending question because it shows that if you do have that focus and if you do have that resolution, in the end it does pay very important dividends. So there may be light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, Thank I'm you very sure much. Thank you.